A year ago, I was on call in the emergency room when several accident victims came in. One of the patients required an emergency procedure where we opened the chest to address life-threatening injuries. And I'm looking around the room to see who my team members are. And I wonder, have they done this before? And are they ready to do this right now? Because this patient doesn't have much time. I spot my chief resident and I say, come on, let's go. We need to crack the chest. So she begins to prepare the surgical instruments while I prep the patient and I'm in her ear. I need you to get in quickly. Cut through as many layers as you can with the first swipe of the scalpel and don't worry about the lung. When we get in, we find normal looking heart tissues, but a horribly abnormal heartbeat. And then the heart stops. So she reaches in quickly and she begins to squeeze the heart between her fingers. And all of a sudden, the heart starts beating again on its own. But these beats are short-lived, and once again, the heart stops. So then I try. And I go to reach in, and I grab the heart, and I feel something hard against my finger. And immediately, I know this is not supposed to be here. So I yell for the surgical scissors, and I take them, and I cut open this area, and this dark blue blood clot comes gushing out. And then the heart starts beating again. And this time, the beats are strong and sustained long enough for us to get the patient to the operating room to address all of the other injuries. Now, while this is an extraordinary series of events for the, my team members and the patient who is alive and well today, as a surgical educator, I'm thoughtful about two things. One, I don't know why my resident missed the hard blood clot around the heart. Were her hands not in far enough? Was she actually touching it and didn't recognize it? And two, after this extraordinary learning opportunity, I didn't get a chance to discuss it with her because things were moving so quickly. And this is not just a random, lost opportunity from a learning perspective. This is something that happens every single day, every hour in the medical profession. For my resident, this was a case of haptics, the art and science of touch, knowing how to touch something, knowing how things are supposed to feel. Being able to discern the difference between something that's normal and abnormal. And the tricky thing about haptics is we don't have a surefire way of teaching it. We don't have a way of measuring it. And therefore, we don't have a way of ensuring competency. So how are doctors supposed to learn? How do you master a body of knowledge when some of the most important things you're supposed to know can't be taught in a lecture, can't be read in a book, and sometimes can't be experienced in an emergency situation when things are moving so quickly. Well, this is the big mess. Doctors go through years and years of training to become top-notch elite professionals. But when you look at our training, it pales in comparison to other professionals. Athletes, for example, have access to instant replays, video reviews, and years and years worth of performance data and metrics that help them to understand exactly what it is they need to do to master their craft. The best we have in the medical field is the tried and true board examination. But this is a pencil and paper test, a test of cognitive and declarative knowledge. We don't have a test for hands-on skills, and we desperately need one. So why am I here? Why is a surgeon standing on this stage talking to you about haptics? Well, part of the answer can be found in my childhood. When I was 11 years old, I was the director of a transplant clinic. I was very adept at fixing stuffed animals that were injured during the course of play. I also fixed Barbie dolls, bikes, electronics, and other things. When I, got, when I cured all the patients, I, I took on the task of taking care of other things. My only defeat was the washing machine. 
But that didn't stop me. I remained incredibly curious about how things were made and what it would take to fix them. When it became clear to me that my biggest limitation was access to bigger and better tools, it was time to negotiate with my mother. And I had a well-crafted argument. Unfortunately, my argument for bigger and better tools was based on the fact that I had only been electrocuted once. <laughs> I thought that was a great track record. In the end, when I think about my transplant clinic and my handyman or handy girl activities, it's very clear that these events shaped my life and who I am today and what I'm doing. And obviously, this is one of the reasons why I became a surgeon. When I got to my surgical residency, I had high expectations. I had high expectations for the tools that I would have access to in the operating room. I had high expectations for the technology that would be available to me to help me take care of my patients. I also had high expectations for the way that I would be trained. I had played sports all my life. I fully expected to get detailed information about what I needed to do to become a master surgeon. And not only did I not get the feedback that I was expecting, I also found it odd that I was expected to read about what I'm supposed to do with my hands. And there were a number of experiences in my surgical training that gave me a passion for surgical education. I also had a very strong belief that technology could help change the way we are trained give us more feedback. And all of this passion and belief led to a major career change for me. And at the end of my residency, I applied to the School of Education at Stanford. My first class was a class on human-computer interactions. Our first assignment was a prototype competition. We have 48 hours to come up with an idea build a prototype, and then give a presentation to our classmates that would convince them to drop their project and work with you on yours. And time was of the essence. And things were looking a little bleak for me in terms of finding something to build my prototype. Until I spotted a pack of badminton birdies. And I thought, hmm, you know, this could serve as a great tumor or an internal organ that may help me to explain to my classmates some of the nuances and difficulties of teaching certain medical exams and procedures. And once I thought more about it, I then began to gather some other items. An empty roll of toilet paper, some saran wrap, and a can of Play-Doh. And these four items would seal the deal for me to build the perfect prototype. And my presentation went beautifully. Everyone got it. And I was able to convince one of my classmates to drop his project and work with me on building my very first simulator, a sensorized clinical exam model. Well, this class project would land me my first patent a patent on the use of sensor technology to measure hands-on performance during procedures and exams. And I have been working with people like you ever since. Engineers, designers, technology developers. And I am having the time of my life. Collaborative play is the best. A recent discovery in my research lab helps to underscore the potential use of this technology in the medical field. We developed a set of sensor-enabled breast models for competency testing. And this is where we made a fascinating discovery. About 15% of experienced clinicians use a haptic technique that's ineffective. And I have the instant replay. 
So on the next slide, you will see a video next to a black screen that is a sensor map. And you will see where the person is touching and with how much pressure, real time. There's a huge difference between the person on the top of the screen and the person on the bottom. The person on the top of the screen missed the lesion. Now what's alarming about this is when we looked at the data, when we got into the details of it, it appears that people were trained this technique. What's exciting about this is we were able to discover this faulty technique with sensor technology that's readily available today. What's also exciting about it is that this ineffective haptic technique can be remediated. And this is the first time, this is the first public disclosure I've made of this research. This is hot off the press, so I haven't, I'm thoughtful that I haven't had an opportunity to tell those physicians that their technique is wrong, but I intend to, I definitely will. <laughs> um, again, this is, it's, it's exciting that we have this opportunity now that we've, we're able to discover it, and I can eradicate this and stop this faulty technique from being handed down from, by tradition. So where do we go from here? What can we do to help the medical profession get to the next level with respect to performance measurement? The first thing we can address is the technology itself. There is a lot of great technology out there. Sensors, motion tracking, wearables, physiologic monitors, you name it. But most of this technology is not built with medical training in mind or human performance measurement. And all that means to me is that there are incredible opportunities to repurpose currently available technologies and expand their use. And that's good business. The other thing to address is really the number of researchers, designers, innovators, developers who are working in this area you and the audience have the perfect background. You have a passion for healthcare. You have a passion for innovation. And you have a passion for change. Let's work together to move this agenda forward. The third thing is really sort of a nuance of the profession itself. It's not common for doctors to have access to instant replays and video reviews of what they do because it's actually discoverable from a legal perspective and can be used against us. When we solve that problem, then will we really be able to take education and assessment to the next level? That's the final frontier. The first two we can address today, not to be a Debbie Downer, the first two we can address today. And when we do this, I believe that when you come to my office, instead of asking me, am I board certified, you're going to want to know my haptic score, because that's what matters in the operating room. So let's create the future right now. Let's take medical training and specifically assessment and testing. Let's take it to the next level, above and beyond the pencil and paper test. Because when we're able to do that, when we're able to make assessment as comprehensive, as interactive, as our everyday work experiences as clinicians, then we will have achieved justice for our profession and our patients. Thank you. <laughs>